did see that and it did make me giggle. <laughs> it was nice that you had a, a nice evening. Did you go as well, Pat? Yes, yes, it was great. Yeah, Fantastic. unfortunately, I needed to go for a wee and they were having a break, so we, we kind of scarpered, you know. But <laughs> I, I wouldn't have. I, I would like a hot mulled wine next time. <laughs> a very warm one. <laughs> No, this seems lovely. I, I think it's the cold, though, that really uh, gets it was, you sometimes. It was but. very cold, yeah. But um, we bundled up. Recent, yeah, recent that's time, the way to do my past. Time, yeah, and uh, yeah, it was it was good atmosphere. Good. Um, but but uh, as far as other archaeology goes, well, no, it's just a very dark time of year, isn't it? You know, it's mm. um, it kind of makes you feel like it's in the past you know it feels like it, you're drawn to I'm yeah. drawn to like old castles and you know things and and you know you look at the hedgerows and the trees and they're all um you know black you know against mm. the sky and and uh, it's it's a fascinating time of year really yeah it's lovely yeah I think uh, going to uh, Tinkinswood at this time of year is lovely to uh, go to. I don't know why it just pulls me there. Yeah, I, I think it's got an atmosphere and, and you can imagine, you know, it's it's sort of a dark time of year. So it's pretty grim, mm -hmm. really, you know, with the rain and the and the wet and everything. And it kind of, you think of people when they were, you know, just living in little, you know, huts and things, you know. Yeah. And, and you think, gosh, I wonder how they managed, you know. It's not so bad, <laughs> is it, really? <laughs> no, no. Us, really. <laughs> Thank so, you, Anne. Yeah. Um, Richard, any news from you uh, today? No, nothing. No, that's well, fine. No, fine. So I'm thinking this week. <laughs> it's fine. Richard is fine. Um, thank you. Um, Pat, anything that... This caught your attention this week that you want nope. to share? No, nope. no, that's fine. Um, well, there's been a lot of things I think that have popped up on my news feeds this week, but it's just trying to actually trying to see if, yes, there's a, an amazing link, and I will try and get the link up so I can send it to you. But it is on Historic England blog, uh, blog and it talks about the seven abandoned villages that can teach us about medieval life. and mm -hmm. That's something that I've always liked looking into, um, something I've done with my uh, masters and um, definitely something that caught my attention. So that was really good to look at um, because they just go through um, all these villages that you, you might not see if you just do a, a basic Google search. And they give you the aerial photography of these sites because not all of them have been excavated and you can clearly see them that the, the very clear as day obviously Warren Percy is there um not a person the uh, settlement that's near York um which is a fantastic site and we went to uh, that place on our trip to York last year last year or this year oh this year has flown by um I cannot believe that we are towards the end that it feels like time's all mashed together so um I'll get stuck into today if I can click this my uh, laptop's going a bit slow so I know that everything's fine with me being seen so I'm just going to go ahead with it and not stress too much um I've chose manor houses today I'm um, not going to given a time period because um we'll be looking at a manor house that's in the Elizabethan period as well and so it's, it's not strictly medieval um but we'll be looking at uh a few of them. Um, the first one we'll be looking at isn't in Wales, um, but it was what sparked um, my interest for today. Um, so I, I think one thing that I wanted to look at, why I wanted to look at uh, manor houses, is because they're so rich in the archaeology and the material culture that you can reveal a lot of the economy and the connections, the industry, um, that the owner, um, how they were able to uh, represent their wealth through many things, how their um, settlement worked, etc. And I think focusing on manor houses can make it very easy for an excavation rather than um, if you have a settlement. Um, it can sometimes be a bit difficult um, to actually pinpoint 
what house to do so sometimes most people will possibly focus on a manor house because that can bring a lot of archaeology it can also tell you the wealth of the settlement can also tell you a, a lot of the uh, manor owner and this important individual in the settlement um i would like to do another lecture about um just everyday people in um, settlements and their structures and what we can find for the archaeology and um, but I'm slowly looking through a lot of articles to find that out because it just seems to be um, a discussion in history to always look at the it's that great man theory isn't it looking at the uh, elite um, especially one individual and just see how great they are um, so I want to try and break beyond that so that's my little project I think of, uh, for 2022 um, because I've got to give myself a project because uh, uni will uh, be over. Um, so I thought focusing on manor houses in Wales can show how Wales is thriving, especially South Wales, which is uh, my main focus, but how we can bring forward perspectives of how medieval settlements were formed, how they um, how they traded, what, what, what was going on really. And I think that's why I picked today. There is another reason why I picked today, which we'll see in the next slide. But they're not just med they're not just from the medieval period manor houses. They're younger manor houses in date. I would say they're more extravagant with the stonework, um, which we'll see how they have uh, stonework and they carve into the stone, and that's how you have the fireplace, or that's how you have the front of the house. Um, so it's it's almost like um, there's always new bigger ways to show off your wealth um, and each time it gets a little bit more in your face but it's fantastic to look at um, but looking at manor houses they can bring out so many finds so many I, I call them treasures most people think if it's not gold or uh, precious gems etc it's it's not treasure but to me they are um, a treasure so um, what, what I think what we need to look at today is just manor houses in general and um, possibly just look at the interpretation we have and I will be putting um, some articles, some information. You okay, Anna? You're putting oh, something. Yeah. It's okay. It's all okay? I think Carl's typing. Oh, it was confusing. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right, Anne. Um, so I will be looking at a few um, articles, especially some from the Bristol and Avon Archaeological Society that looked at Trelec and we'll be looking at some of the, uh, well, for example, I have an unpublished uh, master's thesis on Trelec, um, which was very interesting to read, actually, and something that I referenced quite a lot in my dissertation. So um, we'll go into it. But this is the first one that really took my interest. Um, I was just doing my things sometimes online, looking at little articles, delving deeper into things, looking at YouTube uh, channels. And sometimes I do go down some right rabbit holes and I end up with some really weird things, but I think that's just how the internet works. But um, I come across this, um, which this is the reconstruction that we're seeing here. <coughs> and this was a reconstruction given to us by Wessex Archaeology. Oh, and this was work during the HS2 project um, that revealed this um, large manor house with um, a moat around it as well. And it's absolutely fantastic to look at. Um, and I thought that this is fantastic. I, I would love to talk about this, but obviously we focus on Wales and um, can't use that. And then it sort of sparked all my interest and knowledge of uh, other manor houses. So I thought we'll start off with this is to see where I was going. But this is interesting because there's a lot of finds being found here from the 19th century. And um, it seems like this was a place that was almost forgotten um, and it was only found during this project. But it is an, an, an uh, it is an Elizabethan manor. Sorry, my mouth of tongues are getting a bit tied there. This has a house with a moat, and it just shows you how much uh, wealth this individual would have had to own this. Um, and I think we will know more as time goes on with this. But it was just very interesting, and something that this could be my news basically uh, for this week. And they 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 really want to. Uh, 
slowly try and uncover more um, and try and get as much of the archaeology protected, so such as artefacts, etc. And it's showing that a very wealthy individual it, it is here, um, that was here, and that they can bring out much more knowledge than just looking at the structure. So it, it is nestled in a bend in the River Col, um, and it's quite unusual, the shape of this manor house. Um, it's octagonal uh, shape, so this is how the moat is. And um, you see how it was once protected, but by the, uh, the soil, etc. because there was a lot of archaeology that was there that was well-preserved, but as they're slowly removing things now, obviously um, they've got to try and get to that point where it was protected against any further work. Um, but you see how um, this manor house, this structure, it was, uh, it had sandstone walls, um, it had clay pads uh, placed at intervals to support these wooden beams that were being used. So there is timber also being used. Um, and you have that, um, you have the earliest levels of the manor, and this is thought to be the earliest phase of this hall. Um, this manor is... Um, thought to actually start his life in the medieval period so even though they're calling this elizabethan this started off in the medieval period and um you can see how this would have been a very large medieval manor complex and it's obviously grown um as time's gone on so what happened they believe is that there was some damage to it in the medieval period and then as you get to the elizabethan period they start to reconstruct more onto it um, but there was also later brick wall, walls actually being found at the manor from around about the 15th to the 16th century, and even some brickwork beyond that time period. So what they're seeing here is obviously a building that um, is it's almost like it's uh, gone from memory. Um, and it does remind me of, uh, the, the, there's loads of reasons as to why, and it always reminds me of, um, for example, urban exploring, when you see these fantastic houses and people think, oh, how could they abandon them? And I always just think that it was crazy to abandon these houses, and there's many reasons as to why. Um, and I remember, for example, um, one building I had found um, in Spain and people who lived next door said that, oh, that house is, it, we're trying to sort it out um, legally because it's a, it's a little bit of a danger to everyone that lives nearby, but it's crumbling. And I thought, well, why would anyone let that, a building like that in such a beautiful area crumble? And it was because um, the, the children that inherited it had moved off to the city and no longer in the, uh, the rural area of Spain. And so it was just left to crumble. And it just sort of makes you think that could this happen to any of these houses? Um, sometimes it doesn't have to be famine or these big um, events to actually push people away from these areas. Sometimes it's just as simple as that it's, uh, it's redundant or um, people who have it are just no longer interested in the future. But what we're seeing here from the archaeology is, is an echo of these, um, these fantastic uh, structures, but also the ornamental gardens that have been found as well. You, you, they're actually finding some gravel paths that would have formed walkways to these square beds um, where they would have planted medicinal herbs and that would have been very important in this period um, especially with the medieval periods as well to have herbs etc because um, it, it, it is your medicine in that time period and Bold's leech book which is made way way much older tells you how they relied on a lot of herbs for their medicine so you can understand why um, there would be an area designated for that. Um, but they also found a lot of flowers as well and um, vegetables to eat found on the site. So it seems like this was a very sufficient area and very grand as well. Um, but the surrounding the moat, there is 1.8 metres uh, deep, so in depth of water. And it shows that this uh, landscape was artificially raised so at the bottom of the moat, there's a wooden stake which marks um, from a chain or a strap that was found at the bottom as well. And they start to find, which is quite interesting, a lot of 19th century artefacts um, 
So there was a, a French inspired harness that was found um, here as well. Um, and it, it was fantastic to actually have a look. It was, um, they think it was for a horse um, and it would go on the collar or the reins, but it was, uh, it's, it's almost like this fantastic um, artifact that would just clip on, just add more, um, well, it's another way of showing off your status and wealth really. But they also found um, a decorative piece of uh, furniture fitting that had uh, loops on it. So they think that it was possibly attached on both ends of this artifact. Um, and it was made from copper alloy. And it, again, they think this is from the 19th century, but um, this is a, it's had this Chinese style dragon to it. Um, another fantastic um, find. This was really interesting to read about, especially how we've got um, evidence of the medieval period um, with the earlier phases of the uh, structure, how we have Elizabethan um, influence here with the uh, gardens and the moat. Um, and even how we've got artefacts coming from the 19th century it just seems absolutely fantastic, this uh, site. And it does make you wonder what is going on here. So it brought my interest to Welsh manor houses. And um, we always uh, see these fantastic things um, in the news. And I thought, let's go and have a look at Welshman's, see what we can see there. But of course, um, I'm going to mention Cosmessons. So if I have a look at my notes, because I've written um, too many for my own good at this point, so doo -doo 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 -doo. if I can get up the page. So um, yes, my notes were written um, from an excavation report um, that was in 1993 by Phil Andrews. And I think this was a very good report because when you look at the Glamorgan and Gwent Archaeological Trust, it, it's very frustrating sometimes just looking at some of their reports. They can be very short or they can be very long. Um, but Phil Andrews, I think, done a very uh, clear way of looking at all of this, especially looking at the uh, manor house in itself. So um, he, he did say how the work by Glamorgan and Gwent Archaeological Trust can help with, um, it has helped with his understanding, has helped with a lot of the conclusions in this as well. Um, but he sort of talks about how the objectives here was to just look at um, um, that, that there's more evidence of another building. And so that was their aim, was to try and find out um, the, the features of this structure, what can be found, and what can tell us more about the settlement. Um, so it, this was definitely, I think, an important one to look at, and I like how this is presented. I think it was, and I'll have a look at how where it was written, um, Archaeology in Wales, that journal. So... Um, this is definitely one that I felt like was the best to get the most information. So they excavated a small part of this um, area to actually, well, it's a trial excavation, isn't it, to see if you can find anything. And they did find some remains. So this is when they started pushing for um, looking at the soil and everything else. So they were able to find a lot of, um, well, they found a yard wall and they found a lot of <coughs> compacted shells here. Um, at the bottom and um, they found a lot of um, ash at one part of the area and you definitely see evidence of animal bone as well um, and so you can see how with the shells they're benefiting from the coast as well um, with the food that you can get from the coast but I also think um, there is a link in terms of traders with this area with the coast especially with St Mary's Well Bay. Um, I haven't really found anything to actually prove my argument is to write by Sutter Carl if we found so much pottery um, when I went down there earlier this year that indicates trades to go from as early as the 1600s then to me um, it, there was clearly a known harbour here that does look like it has two harbours and that this is an important area and personally it would be very practical for Cosmesson to go to it was a very e easy area to access so that was what my thinking was um, but we're definitely seeing in terms of the pottery that's being found at this site um, to be interesting as well which we'll get on to um, in the next slide. But Cosmeston, if any of you have gone, is absolutely fantastic to go to. Um, I remember as a child actually pulling faces because my mum took me and I didn't like the look of the hog roast that was there. Um, but it was just really strange as a child that really horrified me. Um, but this is a fantastic site to actually look at, to actually experience. And I think um, if any 
you go to uh, Carl's Tuesday lesson or if you have me tomorrow, um, you'll definitely understand um, what I'm talking about. But how archaeology is to be experienced and that's part of the archaeology. And I think they have a good way of allowing people to experience this, to walk around this little village. Just walking around, it just makes you feel like you're there. Um, and I think they're just fantastic recreations anyway. Um, but... Again, this is fantastic because this is um, a settlement It's thought to be from the 14th century. Um, and there's a lot of information that we can find. A lot of people have discussed about um, its, earlier, um, its earlier beginnings and a lot of people talked about at the end of it. And I think it's definitely a place that needs to be loved and cherished because it's taught me so much as well about the medieval period from a young age. Um, but... You see how in 1316, this manor was passed in the hands of the de, de Cravisham uh, family, which was also of Norman descent. Um, and it's the manor house that we're interested in, really. Um, but there is a lot of information here. And I think the reconstruction that we see is, is a fantastic way of uh, bringing the reports to life, I think, sometimes, because it, it just allows you to vision it better. There is a lot of... It, information about it going all the way down to um William the Conqueror's invasion and how this was something that was set up in the early 12th century as a result of that um but there is discussion about how the manner of this area from 1437 is starting to uh just go to ruin really which is a shame um and it just ended up being just uh, stones in the end um but uh, it was also a, a small population to this area, around about 50 to 100 people at most, um, and that was including children. But you definitely see how this was um, in the earlier uh, history that this was owned by the de Constantine family, which is, uh, they originated from the P P Constantine um, Peninsula in northern France. So again, is that connection with uh, Bordeaux and with trade? It's almost like we've always had connections with northern France and there is a draw to South Wales for northern France as well. Um, but this is where you start to see them building the original manor house um, and farms, etc. But when you get to later medieval period, um, you see how this is a community that's better regulated, it's more compact, um, it's thriving more, you see a lot of skill, a lot of wealth. And this is what's really interesting me here, because it seems like this has gone through another phase. It's a new chapter in the history of Cosmeston. It's thriving. And um, you definitely see how there's a lot of talk about how that this was deserted due to the Black Death. Um, but they had to combat all these difficulties. They had to um, they had to uh, carry on, and you definitely see how there's some discussion about maybe there's evidence of some life past the time of the 1340s, but there wouldn't have been much. There was just no need to actually stay there at that time, which is a shame. But when we get to um, the modern history, the 20th century, that's when all the evidence of the village had been vanished and so um, the local residents didn't have any idea. Um, but it was when the concrete works and the Cosmes and limestone quarry was closed in 1970, the land was being developed under the Countryside Commission um, and was funding as a, a, a country park. Um, but during the landscaping of this new country park, this is when they start to find new evidence, this medieval village. And I think this is when we start to see um, this become an important area for other things. Um, there was an episode of, uh, um, th this has been in an episode of many productions, um, two that I can think of as well, that it is listed as Doctor Who and Merlin as well. So BBC also comes here for a lot of their dramas, which I, I love um, because it is a fantastic place. So go to the next slide. So um, what we see here, I think, is a very significant piece of cosmetic, which was found quite later in 2011. Um, but absolutely fantastic is this ram's head, um, this ceramic ram's head. And this would have been for a jug, but not just any jug for wine or not any jug for, 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 for water to drink. 
it was a jug to wash hands before you have a, a lovely feast. So this was found near um, the manor house. So as people go to wake, they to wash their hands, the jug. And it did remind me of when we went to uh, Barley Hall in York um, on our trip because there was evidence of a drug like this to wash your hands, because uh, people would eat their hands, for example. Um, and it's, it's only past the medieval period we start to see a lot of awareness on how you should eat and have an etiquette as well. Um, but I just thought it was interesting because this is fantastic. It's not just what it was used for, but it's what is showing us. This has got a lot of skill in it. This, the, the ram, the, the horn, the, the way that they're able to have the mouth as a spout, is absolutely fantastic and beautiful to look at. And you can just imagine marvelling this as is un being uncovered from the ground. Um, you, you'd just be really excited just uncovering it as you go in and just trying to see um, what it would look like. It's a shame that we haven't got the full um, jug, but you can kind of see how it's almost like it would be a little bit smaller and we've only got a little piece of it. But it'd be interesting to see the handle. Um, and it does... When we look at the uh, report itself, the pottery that we're finding, there's a lot of veil fabric being found. There's a lot of ham and green pottery being found. And I think the ham and green pottery, to me, just suggests, again, it's just trade links of Bristol. Which it, it would make sense because the Seven Ash Tree is important for South Wales trade in the medieval period, especially in the later medieval period. Um, but you see how there's evidence of locally made pottery, which is of interest to a lot of people because this locally made pottery um, it, it, it's just screaming you in the face that there is an industry like that in Wales. So one thing that I thought was quite interesting with all of this is it, it's, we're finding more than just the structure and the structure has already been discussed, but we're finding more pottery. So um, one thing I thought was really fantastic was that there's a lot of hand green pottery, which also fits in with my argument, but there's not much red cliff as well. So it seems like this is um, a settlement that really preferred that type of uh, fabric. And you definitely see how this is being replicated because the ram's head isn't hand green. It's actually from a, a local area. They think that it was near Panath this was coming from. And I, I think this is fantastic because it's almost like there's a, a twist, our own twist, South Wales' own twist on hand green pottery. And we've gone all out there with the uh, skill and it's just revealing more to us about the skill of the industry in this period. Um, so you can just imagine how fantastic this would have been to find. Um, and it, it's just showing this thriving medieval craft. Um, and they think that this vessel is from the 13th century. So it is a time period where there is a lot of trades and, and everything's thriving. Um, but it's just a shame that we're not able to see the whole jug, but this would have been for guests. And you can understand how the person in this manor house liked to entertain. And so this status would have been known. Um, John Hines from uh, Cardiff University went on this dig um, even found how this was um, the local veil wear that was being found. So um, he was able to actually make that connection as well. And he said that this was absolutely fantastic because again, we're still having more information um, on this site years and years and years after the big excavation in the 1980s. Um, and you find how the railway is found across a lot of sites across South Wales. Um, Alice Forward talks about this as well. But um, Alice Forward even said how simpler vessels with a round head weren't uncommon in the period. So she understands Alice Forward, who has a fantastic um, piece of work on the pottery around South Wales. Um, it is online, free to read, and it's fantastic. It's just basically a database of all the pottery um, throughout South Wales and where it's from and what it looks like, um, if you're ever interested. Um, but she even talks about how this skilled craftsmanship of ceramic isn't uncommon in Wales and that we need to open our eyes, really, and see how much um, the pottery industry really thrives in South Wales. Um, but this is really interesting, is the nose being used to pour um, uh, the, the water out. Um, and she said that this was um, interesting because it was made from local clay as well, rather than it being imported. 
So we know that from a, a manorial estate, there's going to be high decorative pottery. Um, a lot of it, from what I've seen as well, seems to be a lot of French tableware, um, which shows that there's also high status family of wealth, um, that there's going outside of Britain. But we're also seeing there's an appreciation of local pottery as well. Um, but again, this is just fantastic to actually look at Cardiff University's finds of Cosmetics and how there's even uh, tableware being imported from Bristol and how that can tell us a lot as well. So if we go on to uh, the next slide, if I can get it. So I wanted to look at Trellec. Um, it's, it's a fantastic site and definitely one to actually look at. So the manor is what we're looking at here on screen. Um, and you, you can kind of see how it all would have worked out. Um, and I know what we've done excavations here quite recently. Um, but the work that I was looking at that was really interesting is by Simon Kappa, um, who wrote about this in 2017. And the finds that he presented were absolutely fantastic and showed me the reasons why um, I love this site. But you can definitely see how this is a, a very strategically placed area. It's, a, it's a lot near the border um, and it would have benefited from um a lot of trade there you can see that in the plan you have the there's a castle and that's not far from the manor house there's also been a, a barn and there's even a, a church and fish ponds so this is a very fantastic area and it was Stuart Wilson who was the individual who owned this site they really wanted to prove that there was um a medieval settlement to this area who really wanted to uh, go out there and show um, how important this site was and it really is, is a very rich uh, site. Um, so I haven't got all of the um, article, uh, well, thesis written by uh, Simon in front of me, um, but what I have got is some fantastic things, so we'll talk about that now, but we can see how the connections with the Normans here is, is uh, important because this is where you see this city, it's almost boomed with his uh, trade, um, and I think this area definitely benefited from that type of uh, conquest, um, and I think this is one thing that we see is how uh, it's almost like South Wales just really takes this in for their own benefit because they could see that they could also thrive. Um, but you definitely see how there would have been a, a, a lord living in this manor which would have had ownership over the tenants living on their land. We don't know what life was like for them, um, but there was services and protection provided by the lord of the manor, the individual that was living in this one that we're looking at. Um, but there would have been um, a bedroom, servants' quarters, bakery, uh, possibly a dovecot, um, stables and a kitchen found in the manor house. And um, there is evidence of a dovecot as well uh, being found at uh, Cosmeston as well, from what I've read in some reports. Um, this is absolutely fantastic looking at this house because um, this individual has gone really uh, out there, even to talk about the dimensions of, of each area and its interpretation. And you can definitely see how they've, uh, they're able to identify a porch, they're able to identify um, a, um, an oven in the middle, a round stone, how they're able to find a great hall, a cross pa passage, a pantry or a storage room. Um, they were able to see how there was a, a drainage as well, so maybe um, laundry being done there. <clears throat> they found a water well. Um, again, this would have just brought water, um, and there is a lot of uh, information about a chapel and a tower. This person had a lot of uh, wealth here, and the uh, structure, it's not just the structure, but also the archaeology is telling this as well. So I think this is valuable to those locally and, and across Wales, and I love how there has been given a lot of attention and love to these types of sites, because you can understand them more from just looking at the archaeology. And it has brought a wider discussion as well, another, and another example of manor houses in Wales. So this is just a reconstruction. Um, when we were um, there, when I went with Carl, um, there is a, a wall that's being found um, further away from the, the tower. So um, it'd be quite interesting to see where that goes. But that's what the, the reconstruction based on what we see in this report. And you can see that there is a porch and you can see the well. And you can see how there was a great hall and there's other functions. And um, the tower there is just fantastic as well. It's, it's again, it, I think it's just 
trying to speak oh look at how much money I've got and the chapel I think is another way of um some of a lot of money actually finding it uh, showing their worthiness um their worthiness uh, to God um and spending money on that um which I know now um they don't teach that um in Catholicism they, they it's more about what you do rather than what you pay for um, but it's quite interesting but this is thought to be this town is thought to be the largest in medieval Wales and so this is important um it was founded by the the de Clare family it's possibly an, an industrial center and it was destroyed later by Owen Glyndor in a rebellion in the 1400s but what I thought was quite interesting is that um, I, you do have evidence of um, metalworking or industry here, um, which is discussed in this report with a lot of iron, uh, iron slag being found, which we did also find um, in the area. There's lots of pottery. Um, and you just see how fantastic some of the finds are now. If, if I can show you um, this, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, um, but this is just... Uh, a jug that they found if you can't see any of it i'll quickly flick through and show you at the end um but it's just fantastic and it does look similar to the the jug that's found at kenfig if you can have a look at that on uh on the national museum of wales website um but you definitely see how there's a lot being found here in def in different areas even coinage which i thought the coinage was actually interesting to look at as well um, so they've given us three types of coins here and um, very well preserved as well. Um, so we definitely see how there's uh, connections with Ireland here, with uh, England. Um, this is a, a site that's showing wealth because of the coinage. And to me, this would just suggest trade. If there's trade being suggested with Ireland, then that's screaming um, a lot as well. But this person is really showing how there's a lot of roof tiles being found here, a lot of coins, a lot of pottery. Um, and they've given a quite a good um, sort of uh, table, if you'd like, to show all this. And um, the earliest piece of pottery is being found from the 1100s of a specific type. And uh, it goes all the way up to the 1400s. Um, which I thought was quite interesting. They're able to show you where, what types of pottery and how long it's gone for. But what I think is shown here is how Stuart Wilson was right to make that jump and really show off the fantastic features of Trellis. Um, because it, 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 it is important to uh, know about and actually um, get, get to grips with. Um, but one, one of my favourite finds of this is actually uh, something else, which um, if I can find it, it is absolutely fantastic. Um, some of us on the Thursday class were marvelling over a leather, leather shoe that was found um, in, New, in the Newport ship. It was absolutely fantastic. It was a really long, typical medieval boot. Um, but this one here is, is, is little pieces that they found. And the reason why it was so well preserved was because it was found in the well. Um, and th this had been worn um, by a very wealthy person um, because it, there was more than one piece of uh, the, the one piece of footwear. There seemed to be two different types of footwear, um, and it shows that they had um, holes and how this person tried to piece them all together just by looking at the pieces that they had. Um, but this is quite a rare find and it's absolutely fantastic as well. So um, you definitely see how the well really has provided us with some fantastic finds and one to actually uh, really love and appreciate. Um, and we're also seeing evidence of, for example, oh, um, there was this flower pot that was found as well um, with a decoration here. Um, so this was a, a, a found in uh, medieval Britain and they think that this one would have held uh, plants or flowers or even herbs. Um, and this would have been something to show off again. It was more affluent to have a, a flower pot with lots of decoration on it um, and definitely shown off the affluence in this status, which you can see here. Um, and I think really what, what we're finding here is how um, the, the, there is different phases to the building, there's different types of occupation and how it moves on to the different types of trades based on ceramics. 
And it does fit in quite well with um, Alice Forward's work because you do see evidence of some uh, ham green pottery being found there as well, but a lot of uh, other pottery being found that could be locally sourced. And especially with this being such a thriving area, it doesn't seem too crazy to suggest that, really. Um, but that is also something that's free online. is called um, Assessment and, Compar and Comparison of the Architectural and Archaeological Characteristics of the Main House at the Lost City of Trelec Excavation by Simon Kepper. Um, and that's online free for you to read. And you can really delve in deep to that and actually explore all the finds and see how fantastic this site is. Um, so my final final manor house here is uh, one that was actually put on sale. Um, again, I would love to buy this myself, but uh, I don't think I could um, because I don't have the money for it. But I would love to. I would actually do anything to actually own this. And the person who does own this, um, they must really wake up every day and just marvel because I would. I would just stand outside every day just looking at that fantastic um, craftsmanship and the stonework there. Um, but this was on up for sale. Um, and this is a Tudor mansion with a garden. Um, and it is described as a manor house um, and it is grade when listed. Um, but this is fantastic because it gives you wow factors. Look at how fantastic that is. There is even evidence of fireplaces there that's been carved into the wood. Um, and this is more impressive than just a, a summer house or even a shed. This is a piece of history that you have, that you own, that you can live in and that you can experience every day. Um, so this is the old uh, Bupree Castle that's near Cowbridge in the Vale of Camorgan. And um, this was being put up for um, one million two hundred and fifty thousand um, pounds, and it had this lovely uh, country farmhouse attached to it as well. So it isn't just this; this is just part of the um, the building. But it, it is fantastic. Imagine just owning all of this. This is something that dates back to uh, the oldest section, which is ruins, and you can't live in there. I mean, you see this medieval fireplace there of these fantastic ruins that is slowly being overtaken by uh, weeds, etc. But you can still walk through it without it being a danger to yourself. I think the person who actually owned this before it was sold really did understand the importance of this manor house. Um, and it's dated back to the 1300s. And it has this fireplace as well with these fantastic extensions. And you see how there is um, even more extensions being added in the 16th century um, by the owners, the uh, Rice uh, Mansell and then the Bassett family as well. And it's fantastic. There's um, Obviously, there's a lot of love and care that's been put into the building of this. Um, there was... Uh, there was no kitchen or diner single story extensions. These buildings were um, lavish and they included um, a well preserved outer gatehouse as well, which was built in 1586, where the majority of this building was created. And you have this impressive three story Renaissance porch as well that was built in the 1600s that we're seeing. And it's absolutely fantastic to look at that. There's lots of history going from the medieval period to the 1600s, which just shows off how fantastic it is. But you can see how the Bassett family even decided to show off their wealth and their local importance with these carvings and inscriptions that would have survived for centuries until today that we can still look at. And it really is your, in your face here. Um, there's lots of discussion here about um, in, the, in the Tudor period, there was connections with um, Henry VIII. Um, so uh, th there is a lot of uh, connections with Casa with this. Apparently they look after it, but I'm not sure. But they think that this was thought to be in an Anglo-Saxon um, Norman name for the castle, and it was thought to mean beautiful retreat. And this was fantastic because it just shows how the rich would go off here um, for a rest, really, it seems like. And even looking at how the house looks from the outside, um, looking inside in the, the parts where people are living in, it's absolutely fantastic, really, because you can see how they still incorporate with the history. And I think that's how we see that this is an experience. Um, this is an experience for everyone to get involved in. But Again, imagine seeing that you own this manor house, this, this castle, 
and it's thought to have connections with uh, Henry VIII. I have seen quite a few um, articles, etc., talk about how there's even um, relation to Henry VIII, how we could have come here um, almost like a, a break from self. Um, but the reason why this came to ruin was really with the Bassett family, with the English Civil War, how um, they, they, they lost their fortunes and this would have been passed on to another family. Um, and it was in 1709 when it was becoming um, a bit of a ruin where it was going to disrepair. Um, but there is definitely some fantastic history around this. Um, and I think the reason why they talk a lot about Henry VIII here, I think it was more for a selling standpoint. Everyone knows Henry VIII. Everyone wants to have connections with Henry VIII. And so if they showed off that more, maybe that was what would uh, bring people to his attention. But personally, I think it tells us a better story just looking at the archaeology and history that can tell us the facts that this was owned by a rich family um, and this did have medieval connections. But if Henry VIII was there, we, we don't care or not, because we can just marvel at the beautiful architecture, especially that one there from the Bassett family in the 1600s. Um, it is absolutely fantastic, and I would love to own something like this. So I think what we're seeing here is that the knowledge is being provided by these sites is shown how they're vital, I think, for archaeological investigation, how it can bring us more information. Um, Simon Kepler really showed that quite well with the, the manor site. Um, especially all the pieces of pottery that he's uh, showing us and how we're able to uh, actually look at it. Um, it really is fantastic because you can see how, um, the, like I said, there was hand green pottery being found in Trelec, um, even Redcliffe where as well. So we've shown that there is a trading point nearby. And the Severn Estuary is so important with these sites because you can see that Wales really saw this as an important area to trade and have connections. And I think it helped Wales thrive, really, um, to work with their neighbours, Ireland and England, to actually grow further in their ceramic industry as well. Um, but when we look at the medieval period and the Elizabethan periods, we see how structures are important to show off wealth and status and how this individual was able to have a lot of money and the village around it as well, how that was thriving. And I think the public um, really love looking at cos places like Cosmeston where they're allowed to interact with it, having um, it's brought to life. This is something that keeps it interest. And when we look at manor houses, I think we can marvel at them. It might not have gold or, or jewels, et cetera. That's not what they, we're there for. We're there for the pottery and the evidence of um, stone masonry, of other crafts, of uh, looking at leather boots, looking at coins. We can find so much more about trade and industry and economy um, and what life was like for individuals of wealth um, in that period and how they were able to show that off in many ways, even down to just a flower pot in Trelec. So I think what we need to understand here is how manor houses are really vital, I think, for understanding a lot of things. And I think um, they do need deserve a lot of attention, and a lot of uh, reports that sort are of dedicated to it, show off how important they are for the study of the period. So I think I'll uh, stop sharing now and I'll ask questions. So, Anne, is there anything that you'd like to uh, ask or add? Oh, Anne, you're on mute. Yeah, the first, the first uh, house you went to, I couldn't help feeling it was a bit like St. Fagan's Castle. I thought you know, that as well, Anne. Um, you know, maybe the same thing happened, you know, the sort of uh, progression of, of um, the house. But maybe not as, mm. as early, you know, but um, that was interesting. And, um, and I thought that... Uh, the, it's a nice cross section of, of you know to start with what we've got in, in Wales. Mm. And, um, but uh, oh, what was it? I forgot what I was going to say now. Uh, yes, I can. If if you want me to come back to you towards the end, I can while you uh, remember. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all right. Thank you, Anna. I'll uh, I'll come back to you. Pat, is there anything that you'd like to ask or add? Um, <clears throat> when we were looking at the front door. You said it was a three-story something built in 
sometime or other. <laughs> yes, um, I'll get back up. Um, this was built by the Bassett family. So this was three stories high um, and it was carved into stone, whereas everything else was uh, built up with bricks. Uh, it seemed like this was carved into stone here. Um, was it medieval? And I think Not medieval. Was it Elizabethan? Or? 1600s. 1600s? Yes. Yeah, so this was the later phase, the final phase of uh, uh, this this manor house, really. And I think the reason why this one's significant is because it's been carved into stone rather than um, it being built out of bricks. I ah. think it's a really sophisticated way of building. Just the um, doorway, I, is it? That yeah, just there? the porch. Yes. And what's on the right? Is that a tower or? Um, so so uh, on the right, it seems to be the old evidence of the manor house, which would have been around by the 1500s. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But on the left of it is the farmhouse that still remains that you can still live in today. Right. And it, is it Elizabethan? What, what's the 1600s? I don't know what that's called. Um, 1600s, I think it, 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 yeah. Oh gosh, my mind's gone completely blank. Um, <laughs> I always see it as the well, Renaissance. <laughs> Renaissance, that's the word you use. Yeah, Renaissance, that's good. 13. Yeah. Yeah, the 13, it stretches from the 1300s, so early, but then built in 1586. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's Elizabethan. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, it is Elizabethan because I think it was 1603, wasn't it? <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, I've it's, been there. it's just along the way from, um, you know, from the castle. Well, yeah, it was. We saw the sign. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah, going just to look at the site. And yeah, it is so fantastic. Yeah, but it, it, I think it was just on the end of the Elizabethan period. Right. I think it was yeah, because it, it was sixteen oh three. I think that uh, Queen Elizabeth the first died, oh, and right. so yeah. It, yeah, it was just uh, towards so, the end. Of her James, reign. is it James or Paternan? Charles? Charles? Maybe Regency. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, well, and I also want to say your connection is still giving some typing sounds, you know, ever so often. Me? Yeah. Yes. Mm. <laughs> oh, you said tap, it tap, 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 tap. And then it stops. It's a little distracting, that's all. You know, but um, I think you're still that. hearing it now, or? No. Not right this minute, no. All right, okay, I'll have to figure out what that is. The, the, yeah. the laptop is not my best friend at the moment, so if I can need to upgrade. I can upgrade. hear the tapping now. Yeah, when you talk, it, it taps sometimes. Is it, is it stop now, or is it still going as I talk? There's a tap. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I'll have to figure out about that. I apologise. Yeah. Have someone else listen to you, and then you can uh, figure it out, you know. You Try forget. That. Yeah, because I've had a look. There's no wires, so unless there's something going on with my connection yeah, there's two taps there <laughs> oh gosh it's like a poltergeist <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're possessed <laughs> no, I'll, have to, I'll have to uh, stage the laptop yeah no, cont contact a friend and then you two can uh, connect and she can tell you when you're tapping and you can see <laughs> thank you for that pat i'll sort it out That's thank right. you um richard anything that you'd like to ask or add no, I'll say it's really interesting, all the manor houses, you know, that sort of existed in sort of South Wales and sort of the Vale of Glamorgan. Mm. It's just surprising how many have never been found. Yeah, I definitely think there's yeah. way more. Um, and I think the more we find, the more we'll have a better perspective. So I think we're still in the early stages of knowing about it. Um, but definitely one of my favourite things to look at, and I would love to know more, but my focus on next year is to look at um, the everyday person, what we can find out about them as well. Yeah. So, yeah, thank yeah. you. And did you remember what you were going to ask? Oh, yeah, well? I, yeah, I was listening to you talking about, you know, the manor houses and, and how we need to, um, you know, preserve them or find the artifacts and things and I, I just thinking of different gardens and I know it's a modern manor mm. house you know but um I just like the way you know because that was just left to rack and ruin you know we yeah. wasn't really renovated or anything and uh, I love the way they've done that you know and uh, yeah I hope they value our 
you know, houses, because like Tradig House is, is fantastic, you know, uh, it could be a lifelong project. But then you look at um, the one up, you know, near the sister house of it, mm. um, in uh, just up the hill, I can't remember what it's called now, but there's another house up there and it's gone, that's gone to rack and ruin. Yeah, it's a shame. Where you, where, Rupera. Yeah, Rupera yeah. Castle yeah. has just gone, you know, because it's, it's, nobody's taken any interest in it, you know. I suppose mm. it's Philly, really. You know, they've got a big castle, haven't they? Which Cadu is refurbishing, apparently. Yeah. They're, they're really, that's the next project. And they finished at Coity. So people can go to, go to Coity Castle now. They've done all the refurbishment, well, the safety measures, I think, you know. Mm. So, yeah, but it's, in, it's interesting. I'm glad. I hope I'll do a few more manor houses, yeah. I'll yeah, thank you, going. and I think it is interesting. I think uh, it's a shame of Rupera. Um, it's not far from where I live, so uh, it's a shame, really, to see yeah. that go to rack and ruin. Um, yeah. And there's a house nearby from me um, that this all rack and ruin that I can't mm. find any information on. And it has yeah. a beautiful marble fireplace uh, and it's just all full of trees now, yeah. and which is a shame. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, but we must, you know, preserve their story anyway. Yes, yeah, definitely. That's what we can do. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you, Anne. Okay. I'll um I'll speak to you soon anyway. I'll yeah. see you tomorrow and yeah. I'll speak to you soon, Pat and Richard, and I'll see you after Christmas, everyone, on a Wednesday. So take care. Okay. okay. Yeah. All the best. Take care. Now. All yeah. the best. Yeah. Bye. 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 And I'll sort Bye. out the typing noise. Yes. Okay. <laughs> really interesting. <laughs> oh, take care. Distracting. Yes. Are we yes. confirming for Friday? Oh, she's gone. Are we confirming? No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, um, do you want to confirm for Friday or leave it? So um, I think it might be all right. Yeah. Yeah, but don't worry. We'll we'll check each other out. Okay, we'll talk. We'll bye. talk uh, okay. Thursday. Okay. okay. Bye then. Bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. Um, thank you for all who watched on YouTube. If you can like and follow, that'd be great. Thank you. Bye. And, and the the tap in came from your end. Yeah, I don't know what it is, Cole. Is it still going now? Because there's yeah, nothing it's still going now. Yeah.